Good afternoon. Welcome to Coronavirus in Our Mental Health. Today is the first day of February 2023. I'm Ken Burtness, and I'm coming to you from Haleiwa out on the North Shore. And we've got a very special program for you today. We've got a program that takes us back to being ourselves, getting out of that coronavirus lockdown. Um, and my special guest is Nanette Orman, and I will introduce her in one second. Now, Nanette is a very special friend of mine, and uh, I should be calling her Dr. Orman because she's an MD and a psychiatrist. But since I've known her for, and I won't tell you how long, but it's a long time, uh, we're just going to stick to first, uh, first names. Nanette, uh, when you know, we first talked about doing this show, uh, I love the way you said that you know, it's hard being a hermit in the lockdown. And sometimes you know, a lot of people go out and the lockdown eases up. The mask uh, requirements uh, you know, are put aside and everybody goes out and celebrates, but not everybody. Some people, it's a very difficult time to get back into normal time. And, uh, and I thought the idea of the hermit was, uh, was really uh, catching. So for those people who are out there who are having trouble giving up being a hermit, uh, let's talk about some of the things that uh, they might do and we might help with and, uh, and what's going on with all that. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Well, nice to be here. And uh, let me just say that I think that what happens when uh, restraints are lifted and we can go out in the world again, that um, there can be a hesitation as to when, like today, tomorrow, and what is that going to look like? If you are used to hunkering down in your home and ordering groceries online and having them delivered to your front door by someone who you don't even see, who just rings the doorbell and scampers away. And um, after a while, that becomes the new normal. So when the new normal is no longer appropriate because um, restrictions have been lifted, masks have come off, et cetera. Um, you have to rejigger your daily routine and also your thinking and figure out what, what you're going to do with this new reality. It's kind of like uh, going into hermit would, if there is such a word, uh, in reverse, because I recall distinctly that at the time we had to shelter in place, so to speak, that uh, there was some thinking that went on about how that was going to look. And I remember actually taking a pen and paper, because I'm an old-fashioned lassie, <laughs> and writing down what my new schedule was going to be like. And uh, after a while, that schedule became my new reality. And now, all of a sudden, uh, one is asked to give up that, that silly schedule. That, well, it was not silly, really, because it, it made sense at a certain point until we knew what the, what the danger was and who the enemy was. But now we have to find a new routine. I didn't get out of pen and paper when it came time to let things open up. What I did basically was just take off my mask some of the time. <laughs> yeah. Now the problem is for me, you know, and I, I think a lot of people is not only do you have to give up that paper, but uh, you procrastinate. I procrastinated a lot. So I think to myself, well, this makes sense. I need to get out and go out and give up being a hermit. Uh, I'll do it tomorrow, you know, and tomorrow comes around and I say to myself, well, I'm looking at the paper again and I'm saying, well, I'll do it the next day. You know, we'll get to it. 
you know, and it never quite seems to come around because I'm always sort of putting it off for other things. Um, how do we, how do we help people with that, or how, how do we help ourselves with that? Um, it took some pondering on my part about what was going on actually, and eventually I realized that the concept of time had changed for me, that it had become kind of elastic and squishy, and you could take as much time as you wanted, if, and nobody cared because nobody was looking over your shoulder. So um, night and day got blurry, and it just it had a different feeling to life. So um, what I did was basically to ask myself what was going on that, that I was getting so slow with stuff. And that, that's what I finally came up with. How about you? Well, what <laughs> I, I procrastinated a lot with a lot of things, but I didn't procrastinate with other things. And I sort of made a priority thing about something that uh, I needed to do right away. And one of them was this program. This program was of great help in that uh, this program had to happen. Other things I could put off. Uh, and I was into a lot of joy. I was into a lot of listening to music, which not only uh, is an escape, but it's a joyful one. And it made me feel a lot better about what was going on. And a lot of negativity is going on. So. Uh, that's one of the things I really enjoyed doing. And uh, so I sort of tried to make a, you know, have both of them, have my cake and eat it too, be able to do the things I needed to do, but also give myself more time to feel good about the world and about myself. One of the things that I did also was to recognize how fearful I had become. And that was something that fear, it comes up in your life now and then when life circumstances demand it. But um, generally in our day-to-day -day living, we don't think every moment about how something is gonna come out of the sky or out of the air and strike us down because it's pretty hard to live your life. That's your attitude. So uh, I became more aware of my fear and decided to actually give myself some suggestion when I went to bed at night to dream about my fear so that it would have some kind of a shape because COVID really had no shape, it was a fluffy something. And the bigger and fluffier something scary is, the less you can get your arms around it and figure out how to deal with it. It's like the monsters under your bed when you're four and they, you imagine they're as big as the room or as big as the other side of the bed. And it's one of the things that little kids have a hard time figuring out. Yeah. Well, mine was sort of, uh, I didn't go to the dreams, you know, uh, because my dreams are, well, I've kept a dream log for many years, so they're pretty interesting. So uh, I didn't even think of that, to be honest with you. But where I saw fear for me was in panic attacks. I would never had a panic attack before. And all of a sudden during COVID, I was having these panic attacks. And I said, no, this is not me. You know, let's, uh, you know, you better get over this. But that's a hard thing to do. And when you're trying to help somebody else with that fear, uh, just telling them, oh, you shouldn't be afraid. Not very effective. No. <laughs> uh, and it makes you feel a little powerless because not only are you having fearful thoughts, but other people are. And you're having trouble with your own fearful thoughts and they're having trouble with theirs. Uh, so that's something that, you know, I still struggle with today. But uh, mostly for me personally, 
uh, I just sort of try to time it. I just sort of give myself, okay, you're fearful of this. You're going panicky. Uh, you got five minutes, you know, and uh, then you've got to get up and do something about it. Uh, and so, I did but, something analogous to that. Oh, good, good. Which was because I'm a, a retired newspaper reporter and journalist, as well as a retired psychiatrist. Um, I was watching the news 24 seven at first and trying to parse what I heard, which was confusing and sometimes completely contradictory. And uh, I realized that I was just harming myself by watching that much confusing data. So I decided to just turn off the TV, turn off the radio, um, throw the newspaper away or put it in the corner or use it to wrap fish and uh, find something that brought me comfort and peace. I learned many years ago the art of hypnosis. So I'm also a hypnotist. And what I did was start to pay attention to my unconscious thoughts, which you, you can learn to capture if you know what to listen for. Mm -hmm. And then I did what one does actually to induce a trance, which is to breathe in a, a kind of a, a uniform way, image something pleasant, which in my case, a funny thing is a beach in Hawaii. <laughs> And then uh, speak to myself with a positively framed thought, such as this right now is a safe place for me and a safe time. And I don't need to go to dark thoughts, to scary thoughts. But instead, I want to remember times in my life when I faced adversity and did something positive to get my arms around my fear and shape it so that it was manageable. What is it? They, go ahead. No, no, I was just thinking that that was that was terrific. Uh, <clears throat> And I'm glad you you know you had a joyful moment of the memory back to Hawaii. And uh, I'm I'm hoping to talk Nanette to coming back and doing another show because Nanette uh, is a wonder at hula. She's been doing hula for many many years and is with a hula group on the mainland. Uh, and she would come out to Hawaii and join the hula competitions here with her halau. And uh, it's been a wonderful part of her life. And it's it's the times when I got to see her again when she returned to the island for those. Uh, competitions. And uh, I don't think a lot of people think about hula on the mainland, but, uh, you, you know, hope we can come back and you can come back and tell us about that because that's wonderful. But I really like the idea of memories, uh, those good memories that can come back and chase away the gloom because um, all of us have bad memories and good memories. And we need to sort of be able to make that transition from when the gloominess starts coming in to sort of brush away those dark clouds and look at those good memories. Um, uh, any other good memories that uh, help you besides being on the beach in Hawaii that uh, have been <laughs> well, pleasant to return to? Actually, I remembered a time when I was in medical school in my third year when I felt totally inadequate to do what I was being asked to do to remember what I was being asked to remember. And I had something probably worse than a panic attack. I had like a total mental meltdown where I felt helpless to do anything. So I went to the uh, student health service, which had 
therapist for medical students who were falling apart. And one session with the therapist took care of me. And what she said to me was, you know, you've gotten a long way in your life to be where you are right now. And yet all of a sudden you've lost all your confidence and feel like a little baby or like a helpless kitten. And you must have had times like this in your life before. What helped you to get over that? So I then recalled earlier times when I did something difficult and prevailed, did at least a good enough job. And that changed something in me. It was like flipping a switch. And all of a sudden, I wasn't a helpless four-year-old kitten anymore. <laughs> but I became an adult again. And um, it, it was quite remarkable. And I've never forgotten it. So I, I think that experience of, of being able to turn off fear and panic was kind of waiting there in my memory bank for me to use again. And when I was coming out of my little hermit crab shell, <laughs> if you'll excuse the metaphor, uh, and uh, coming back out into the world again, that was something that I remembered. Oh, that's but great. Another thing that I remembered was my hula sisters and how much fun we all had. And we were doing hula on Zoom at that point, which is not nearly as satisfying as being in the same room as someone. But it certainly is better than nothing. And you remember all the good times and all the sharing that you've had with your hula sisters. And it, it's uh, a thought that gives you hope, Ken. Now, you know, we had talked earlier uh, about this, about the, the memory, creating this sensation again. And I, I found that uh, fascinating because that's really the way I feel as well. When I go back to memories, uh, for instance, I no longer can bicycle. And I used to love to do that. Um, I and my friends would bicycle around the various islands in the chain and uh, take three or four days. And uh, I no longer can do that because of physical problems. Uh, because at my age, I don't want to certainly don't want to fall down. Too many of my friends have fallen down and uh, had a problem. Uh, but if I go back to that memory or if I write about that memory, uh, I actually physically can sort of feel that again. And with that feeling, in addition to the thoughts, um, comes joy and uh, comes that good memory. Uh, and that really, uh, really helped me a lot. I wish I could find the switch like you did. You know, the switch sounds, which, you know, I want to reach up and go quick, you know, <laughs> get me out of this thing quick, you know, but uh, sometimes it takes a while. That, that was very unusual to just have a sudden aha moment when something changes in you. Uh, but they're rare and precious. And when you do have that kind of a moment, uh, remember it and save it like a little jewel in your heart that you can pull out and, and touch again when you need to. I also remembered how much I enjoyed being out in the fresh air and uh, Actually, I never gave up hiking on the coast where I live during all of COVID because even though most of us were wearing masks, anyway, we really didn't need it because the wind blows so much that uh, any virus particles would just be blown away. But um, to 
get out and do that and see the ocean and the clouds and the sand and the birds uh, brings a, a kind of peace in your heart and a kind of flow that connects you with nature and the, the steady, ongoing nature of life. And it, it, it's not so much a cerebral memory, I think it's an emotional memory, that it, it just sticks there. And again, it's something that you can pull out and use when you're ready. Absolutely. Uh, Nanette and I grew up in Southern California, and she moved north uh, to a very beautiful part of California, which I've been in many times along the uh, along the coast there. And it is so beautiful hiking in that. And uh, well, I can't go hiking up to my favorite spots. Like every time I get out, I look at Mount Kaala and think, gee, I wish I could go up there again. Uh, but the remembrance of it, and what I did was uh, during the COVID thing is I drove, I got in my car, which I still can do quite easily. And being on the North shore, I took off for, I'm actually uh, by Sharks Cove uh, near Pupakea. And so I drove toward Hale Eva, which put Mount Kaala right in my visual sights and all the beauty that's along that North coast and the ocean and the mountains. Uh, and I wrote a story about it called Driving Without Destination. And I think that that, uh, that really helped me during COVID to, uh, yeah, I was you know, cut off from a lot of things, including teaching and things like that. Uh, but I could still get out and I could still feel that stuff. And I, I think in my previous life, I was a dog. So I love the wind and I love, you know, I want to stick my head out the window as I'm driving and feel that fresh air come flowing in. And uh, uh, it's really a treat and a joy. Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I was in my previous life, but I'm gonna guess a cat uh -huh. because I like to watch cats. I like to sleep, uh, groom myself, <laughs> um, do my nails. So um, perhaps that, that's what it was. Uh, the other thing that occurred to me when we were discussing how one comes back into the world is that thinking of how attractive the world is and the, the places, the things that the enjoyable experiences like concerts, um, uh, competitions, which I love and which are fascinating to watch. Uh, it, it draws you kind of through the door, the front door out to your car so you can get out there and do things. One of the things my Hula sisters did was to set up a, a, an event at a restaurant, actually a bowling alley restaurant uh, down in San Jose where my group danced for many years because our hollow had closed due to COVID. And four times a year, we went to this place, uh, gathered as a group, put our masks on and just danced with each other and that that was such an inspiring thing. Uh, one of my hula sisters actually imagined doing this, and it worked so well that this is, I think, our third year gathering every quarter. We have actually moved on, many of us, to other hula halal, but we still gather all 15 or so of us every Order and it, it's just like no time passed. We're we're all sisters again. That's a that's a fantastic thing because that's uh, when you get older. There's a lot of negatives about getting older, but uh, uh -oh. there's a lot of positives. And uh, 
One of the positives is gathering of friends. And uh, I've been in many groups during my life here in Hawaii. Um, and we still gather together. Uh, one of my book clubs has been going since 1975. So that makes it uh, 40 seven years. <laughs> uh, no, 42. Uh, no, 40. Yeah, 40, whatever. Uh, and we still gather together, you know, and we gather outside. That's one of the wonderful things about being in Hawaii is that we can be outside a lot. Yes. And like Nanette is saying, you know, with the, the breeze coming in, the trade winds blowing on us and uh, just the sheer beauty. Uh, 51 years I've been fortunate enough to live here, and yet the beauty still stuns me when I'm driving around or when I'm walking around, uh, uh, whether it be in, you know, <clears throat> with the gardens or with the mountains or with the ocean. Uh, it's incredible. And, you know, the problem, you know, the thing that I worry about is that, you know, going back to the news and reporting in that, uh, the news that's negative is the one that really sells. Somehow we always focus in on that. It's more dramatic. And uh, our joy comes in very restful, oftentimes peaceful joy, a moment of joy, or many moments of joy. But the, uh, what we're attracted to is all the tragedies that are going on. And, we, and Nanette, I think you're so right in saying that uh, there's wonderful and joyful things happening. It's just that uh, we keep Focusing and the social media sort of guides us to that because that's what yeah. sells. That's what gets people turning on their television. That's what gets pe people looking at their news uh, media and things like that. And uh, we have to make an effort to uh, look for the good things because there is plenty of good things. And I appreciate you sharing that. Yes, um, in my journalism school days, we were taught if it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> So the headlines were always the most horrible thing that you could possibly imagine that day. And that was what caught people's eyes. But um, one has the ability to turn that stuff off or wrap dish in it or decide that that way of doing things is not what's going to rule. One, one's personal psyche. But I think it has to be a conscious decision. And yep. I have a, a book for your book club. It's okay. called A Good Life. I am reading it right now. It is a recent revisiting of a group of Harvard sophomore who, who were originally men who were interviewed by sociologists um, and psychiatrists and others in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and actually several books have been written about them. But the important thing about the current book, which is now interviewing the children of the original Harvard men, which the, the study was originally done by George Valiant, who was a Harvard psychiatrist, but anyway, the bottom line in the book is what is what makes a good life is relationship. It's more important than money, more important than experiences of, of finite sorts. And so if you are really seeking joy, I think your your social connections and your social life are where where the real meat and potatoes lie. Uh, <laughs> that, that's where you can be. And that's where not just your body is nourished, but your soul and your mind as well. Um, it, it really is important. Oh, I totally agree. And I hate to say it, but we've run out of time. And uh, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, we, started. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And we'll have to do this again. And I really appreciate you being on the show, Nanette. I really appreciate you sharing that. And I think you put it so well at the end about uh, finding that uh, that joy and making a conscious decision to do it. Uh, so uh, let me thank you for joining us. And I also want to thank all the people who were watching us today and the Think Tech Hawaii uh, 
staff, uh, Jay and Michael and Taylor and everybody. Uh, and best of all, uh, thank you for uh, you and the audience for joining us. And uh, I want to say have a great day here and aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.